Good morning. Um, as Anne mentioned, I'm Suzanne Turan. I'm working with John Balms and a team that also included Kathy Heaney from Stanford and Leoncio Vasquez from the um, CBDIO, the Centro Binacional para el Desarrollo Indígena Oaxaqueño, which is a Oaxacan community organization in the Fresno area. We were looking at how to engage indigenous farm workers in addressing health and safety on the job. And our premise is really that in order to have healthy, um, you know, just sustainable food systems, that one key component is making sure that the conditions that workers are laboring under are fair, just, and safe. And so um, what we were looking at in this study with the seed funding is that we sought to, first of all, build a foundation for a partnership between university researchers and a community-based organization because we're looking at capacity building and participatory research models. We also sought to, the formative research component was to assess and better understand workers' perceptions around their health and safety on the job and their opportunities to take action and sort of challenges and opportunities for what can be done to promote worker action. And lastly, it was to then use the, fun, uh, the findings to be able to write a subsequent research report, I mean research proposal. And I'm really going to be talking uh, mainly about the findings from objective number two, which was the assessment that we did with workers and with uh, community leaders from the indigenous community. And we carried out three focus groups um, with indigenous farm workers. There were 32 participants. Um, one was in Madeira, and two were in Fresno, and two were in Spanish, and one was in Mixteco. And then we also carried out five in-depth interviews. And you'll see from here, just to give a couple slides on the demographics for the participants, um, about 60% were women, 40% men. They were evenly distributed pretty much across age with a few who were over 50, um, and then a smaller percentage as well, over 60 working in the fields. Um, and one other um, factor that we looked at is the number of years in the industry. And our participants were predominantly workers who had been in the fields six years, I mean, 10 years or more. So they were more of an established um, group of farm workers. We had 20% who had been here six to nine years. And actually, the number of years in the industry very closely mirrored the number of years that they had been in the United States. It was very similar that like once they had been in the United States, they had been working in the fields. Um, so a few of the themes that emerged are the factors that we looked at in the focus groups. Um, one is what hazards and problems did they experience in the fields? And many of these are typical to what you commonly see in farm work. Um, you know, it's from falling from ladders, heat, the pesticide spraying in nearby fields, slipping and falling in muddy or wet conditions. Um, one thing that really was a very common theme was the, oh, I'll come back to that later actually, but getting cut from shears and tools and, and um, sort of the poor quality of their tools. Now the workers didn't mention sexual harassment or stress as sort of hazards that they perceived, but the key informants did say that that was something. In fact, some key informants saying, for example, that sexual harassment was a daily occurrence for farm worker women. Um, and although workers didn't say stress is an issue, they certainly described conditions that we would easily attribute to stressful you know, um, situations. Um, that was more called out by key informants. So as we're looking at this, we were looking at, okay, what kind of factors are influencing their risk for occupational injury or for um, you know, facing mental or physical health outcomes from their work in the field? And we identified, first of all, a few individual and interpersonal factors. Um, one, and I can't go over all of these in like sort of depth as we, anyway, for today, but one of the things um, that really came across is this, the sort of normalizing of risk or accepting the hazardous conditions as the norm, um, sort of saying, well, we do this hard work, that is just the way the work is or the work, the way that, you know, we do heavy work and that's, that's what's involved. Um, there was also a sense of distrust in the, um, those outside the indigenous community or sort of suspicion. And even, to be honest, it was challenging at times. I facilitated two of the focus groups and Leoncio Vasquez did one of them. And just even that interaction, I think, with me as an, even coming in with CBDIO was, um, I definitely noticed that sense of, of you know, sort of 
concern about what were we actually doing there. And one key informant said that um, they're not going to disclose concerns to anyone outside the indigenous community because they'll think you're just coming in to try to take advantage of the worker. Um, lack of unity within the crews is another thing that came up, which actually plays a lot into our sense of how do we build foster collective action and workers taking action together. I think that this comes up a lot because of the nature of farm work, where workers are working in different crews over the course of the season. It's seasonal work, so it's not like you build a sense of you know, multi-year um, of us having a sense of co-workers. But workers definitely thought it had to do with fear of retaliation, which is another common theme, that if someone stuck, stuck their neck out or said something, the rest of the crew was not going to back them up. And that was a, a concern that was expressed. We also heard a number of organizational and worksite factors that influence risk. And this is what I was going to mention at the beginning related to the shears and equipment. Workers, this is a very common theme that they have to buy their own shears, their own boots, their own gloves, or else they're not provided with that. And we have heard before about you know, having to buy your own boots and stuff, but the shears and other tools was something that came up more frequently than at least I had heard it before. And sort of, therefore, it's like their responsibility, how well their equipment is working or not, to be able to do the job. Um, we heard as well about the lack of training or information in their languages, having to sign papers that they didn't really know what those were, and also the challenge of trying to communicate if they wanted to with a crew leader who may not know, you know, they may not be able to really articulate what they're trying to, um, what they really want to say in Spanish, and the crew leader does not know English. I mean, does not know Mixteco, sorry. Um, the crew leader attitudes and behavior, I'm going to come back to later, but that really emerged as a, as a key issue of concern. Um, as, yeah. And then being paid piece rate, as you know, if you're trying to push and work harder. Crew leaders, actually, that was one of the main concerns that workers expressed, was exhorting workers to work more quickly, you know, push harder. That that is an incentive for workers to try to pick as much as possible and, and not um, you know, have an, an adequate work pace. And the presence of regulatory agencies, I wanted to just mention the sort of the, a work site factor that came through from workers was really how much having enforcement of regulations makes a difference, which is not something new, but it really points to the need to sort of to advocate for having that adequate presence. Uh, in one group in particular, they talked about how there had been a big shift that they saw sort of from 2000 to now and what difference there was and they said that it was, um, could be due to two factors. One was the increased immigration enforcement. Oh, one minute, okay. <laughs> Shoot, this went by really quickly. All right, so um, hmm, let me see what I want to, I'm not going to spend my minute thinking about it, but I will say that you know, when, when we're trying to look at workers' ability to advocate, we saw some challenges, but then we also saw that in every focus group, there were workers who had taken action. And so there's a lot of this sense of community narrative of you're going to get, you know, it's going to be impossible, you're going to get retaliated against. But then there were in every group workers who had stopped to clarify wages or who had said we're not going in if, it's, if you're um, not paying us that rate. Wages and wage theft were a big concern. There was also somebody who had called Cal OSHA, and I don't have time to read her story, but it was basically this, this, they did not have water, she pretended to go to the bathroom, and the crew leader had actually followed her and was listening outside the porta potty, which she didn't know was happening, and heard her, and when she called Cal OSHA, and when she came out, he asked, you know, why did you do that? Do you want to work or not? You were talking to Cal OSHA, do you think I can't, I didn't hear you? And while she at first tried to deny it and sort of say she hadn't, Ultimately, she decided, she said, okay, yeah, I did call. The crew leader in the meantime was like gathering the water, getting the ice, you know, sort of getting everything ready for the Cal OSHA um, inspectors who did arrive later. But what was interesting, and this is what points to this sort of like, um, you know, challenge that workers perceive about, it's almost like your personality. Are you willing to, it's not a systemic or something we can sort of structurally think. It's like, are you willing to stick you know, to sort of have the gumption to, you know, stick up. And also from the crew leaders, there's such variability. There's all these uh, comments of abuse. And at the same time, there's also some who, in this case, for example, he ended up saying, well, I appreciate you're honest. 
and you know that you sort of conf- yeah, told me straight to my face that you did call, and so and they moved on. You know, there wasn't the send you home right away, etc. Okay, I'm sorry. I think that, that there's more information on the page um, of the context. We are. I mean, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is that thanks to the funding from. Um, BFI, we did, we have formed a partnership with CBDIO as well as the Stanford researcher. We have um, submitted a research proposal, which we're going to hear about, I think, later this summer to the National Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities, hoping to look at how we can both take some of those stories and, you know, sort of in work with the, the positive stories and think about how to um, disseminate them through social networks to change the community narrative or sort of give workers that experience, as well as looking at ways to, one of the challenges is how do you incentivize better crew le- leader preparation for their role? Okay. Sorry. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And we do have time for about three minutes for oh. questions. So yeah, you can talk more. <laughs> Um, if you have a question, uh, we have a microphone here, and we'll ask it. <laughs> uh, I have a question, Suzanne. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to um, talk about pesticide training, pesticide safety training, and other types of trainings, but I often wonder to what extent do people understand the trainings in terms of both language and in terms of cultural appropriateness? Is that something mm-hmm. you can speak to? You know, we didn't have a chance in the focus groups to probe deeply into those. I mean, what they did mention around training in general was the challenge of, of really understanding it. And even though a lot of the folks, even in the Mixteco group, ended up saying they were bilingual in Spanish and the indigenous language, it's like the extent of fluency in Spanish will vary, right? And so that is, that is something that they identified as like not having good information. Um, but also the other thing is that they, they talked about, I mean, this was something that was surprising even for the group that was somewhat familiar with CBDIO, the community group, that when we asked them, where do you go for other information or where do you turn to, it, they really didn't know. Like they, there was very little contact, you know, with other, with no, knowledge of other groups. And in fact, one of the, gr- one of the workers had a quote that was something, it's like it, the saddest thing in a person's life is when you do not know where to go to complain. You know, it's like, and I think that's very representative of their sense of isolation, you know, of, in terms of seeking help or other information. Oh. Then I give you. Um, so you did mention that the, that a number of the workers had a sense that they did have special skills that they were needed that they were that they were yeah, part I, of an industry over ten years. So I'm wondering how that tension works out between the fact that the growers need them; they're a vital part of the agricultural industry, but their undocumented status, so they're afraid to complain, and yet maybe they wouldn't be fired because, or, or, or deported because they're needed. So how is any, especially now, how is that tension working out? Right, I mean, now there's probably even, I mean, we've talked in other um, areas about the chilling effect on workers, right, in the current. We, took, we did these um, back in 2015, the focus groups and stuff, and certainly with the current uh, administration and policies, it might be, it's, it's even more of a chilling effect on workers' roles. But it, that was something that we were trying to play with a little bit. It's like, okay, the ones who took action, why or why, besides that personality factor that they mentioned, okay, oh, well, she does that, you know, or that's her character, they did mention that those who have been here longer are more likely to, you know, they have a little bit more knowledge of their rights or they have a little bit more sense of that, you know, um, I'm not gonna take this. but. Some mention that they do perceive they have skills and are needed. You know, when they, they do bring something that the, grow, that the crew leaders or the farm labor contractors want. And I think it has varied by region in some ways. Like some, in some cases, there's descriptions of how wages have gone up, what, what growers are offering. Or we've even seen now in the news how, you know, uh, farm labor contractors are, gonna have to, are traveling farther to try to find crews because there's maybe fewer workers. Um, and so that's something that we have to see how that plays out. But in terms of the bigger, um, the you know, most pressing thing of fear of retaliation or the pressing uh, because of immigration status or the pressing need to work, that's something that's really hard. You know, and I think we have to try to 
how do we harness that nugget of feeling like, yeah, you do bring a skill and value and they need you, you know, and, and use those stories from workers that are describing that to start to build that narrative. <laughs>